Hi, my name is Alan Cross, the uh, ongoing history of new music guy, and this is Bridge the Atlantic. Welcome to Brazil Atlantic's interviews, where we get to know the people behind and in front of the creative industries. We are back after our summer vacation, and we hope that you missed us as much as we missed you. We are your hosts, music web designer Ross Barber Smith from Scotland, owner of Electric Kiwi, where we create awesome custom websites for bands, artists, and musicians. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Electric Kiwi. Yeah, and I'm singer songwriter and multi instrumentalist Marcia Novelli from Canada, a man who wears many hats, literally and figuratively. When I'm not releasing music under my own name, I'm producing and mixing records for other artists. Speaking of which, if you'd like me to work on your next song or album, just get in touch. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Spotify, and Patreon as my name, Marcio Novelli. We are excited to share that we've made some pretty significant updates to our Patreon page and we invite you to become an official patron of the show um, because, you know, why not support something you love and we hope that you love us. That's right. Perks include early access to content, sponsored ads at the start and end of our shows, as well as your chance to co-host an episode alongside your two favorite co-hosts. We've also got official BTA shorts available and if you've been watching the show, you're probably aware that we have them in very... Very many. Seven that doesn't make sense. Colors. We have them in many different colors, That's right. different sizes, uh, and we think that you would look pretty awesome wearing them. Yeah, so, and basically, if you uh, don't want to be a patron, or, or if you also are already a patron, you just want to support us another way, wear a shirt. It supports us, yeah. helps us to keep doing the show, and you look pretty awesome while doing so, I'd say. <laughs> yep, I would agree. So head on over to our website and use the coupon code BTA Rocks, and you'll receive 10% off as our little way of saying, Gracias. <laughs> oh, you stole my thing. You stole my thing. And Marcia. lastly, I uh, just want to remind everyone that uh, if, uh, about two, three months ago, I guess it was, uh, I released a brand new acoustic EP, The Reimagining Volume 1, and you can listen to it anywhere you like to download or stream music. I encourage you to share it freely and spread the love throughout the land. <laughs> everyone, <laughs> you know. <laughs> throughout the land. Throughout the land. <laughs> Yeah. So joining us this week out of Toronto is broadcaster, writer and all-round music geek, Alan Cross. Alan is best known as the host of the syndicated radio series, The Ongoing History of New Music, The Secret History of Rock and Explore Music. In addition to his broadcasting career, Alan is also the author of many books on music, including the alternative music Almanic and the history of alternative rock. We're excited to learn more about his career and the advice he'd offer to aspiring music industry professionals. Without further ado, I am so honored to welcome Alan to the show. How's it going? Yay! Man? How are you? Good. I am. I am well. Um, I'm just going to start off right away and, and say I have been listening to the history of I. I what, oh my god! I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry, the history of alternative <laughs> rock. What, what's the name? No, of you know what? I Everybody gets it no, wrong. Now I'm all confused. <laughs> now this. I can't. I can't. I can't think of the, the title okay. right now because I'm all <laughs> nervous. <laughs> Let me let me explain. Yes, I was assigned this program back in 1993. Yeah. I did not, in any way, shape, or form, like the title because it's a stupid title. <laughs> Nobody can remember it. It is called the ongoing, the ongoing history, history of, of new music. Of course, I know. It's, I have been listening since I was a child, but for some reason, after reading the bio, there was like five different histories. I know, and, all, and I just totally got messed up. But don't feel bad because of you. I have become. The person that just if anyone mentions any band i'm like did you know did you know <laughs> yeah. by the You're way that guy. i'm that guy and everyone's like uh -huh. and trust me i yeah. i i deal with this see i call time. those i call those people and i include myself in the, the number you know those are those are musical <laughs> douchebags and... <laughs> i love it alan let's get let's get awkward why don't you tell us three things about yourself that everyone should know uh, I am a student of the JFK assassination. I am fascinated by that sort of thing. I am a travel junkie. I will go anywhere in the world that anybody asks me to go. And I have no other portable skills other than being a music geek. I <laughs> don't really know how to do anything else. I've been doing this for a very long time. And uh, fortunately, they keep paying me to do this. And that's good because I don't know what else I could do. <laughs> well, isn't that kind of a, a lesson right off the bat, though, is you're doing what you know that that you love and that you're good at. I suppose so. But the difference is that there's really no calling for what I do. <laughs> uh, it's in my career has been a complete fluke. 
Uh, there was no, I never set out to do what I'm doing today. I never set out to be who I'm doing, what I, who I am today. It just happened through a series of, of really weird coincidences and, uh, and circumstances. And I'm very, very grateful for it. And I'm never, ever in going to, uh, uh, you know, look a gift horse in the mouth. What did you set out to do? I was going to be a journalist. I was going to be a hardcore, um, I was going to be a news anchor. I was going to be a reporter. I was going to be a foreign correspondent. I was going to be somebody who went out there and told the truth. I wasn't going to be one of these long-haired, dope-smoking DJs. I was going to be somebody doing something serious in the world of journalism. Uh, however, after going to university for three years and then getting my first full-time job as a news person, I realized that I absolutely hated that job. And I lasted 23, uh, 23 days in that position. Oh, wow. Uh, fortunately, though, at, I had been working, you know, to break into the business. What I've been doing is working as a, a normal DJ type. And uh, somebody rescued me. They offered me a job at an FM radio station on day 21 of those 23 days. I left my job so fast that they actually sent the sheriff after me because they didn't pay my rent to my landlord. <laughs> it's true well that's a that's a good story to, to have in your pocket um no kidding. i'd like to ask you as a as a broadcaster and a, a writer how has the music landscape changed over the past 10 years and how have you seen artists adapt to the changes oh that's a really interesting question uh well first of all the internet has disrupted absolutely everything it used to be that we were all about exchanging pieces of plastic that had music on them now we don't even worry about that it's all magic there's 35 or 37 million songs out there available for for streaming at any given second it's it's changed the nature of the economic balance between publishers and artists and labels and everybody else so it's 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 so much different than the way it used to be. You know, doing my job, I mean, I would have to find books. I would have to talk to people. I would have to find press releases. Now, so much of what I do is available on the Internet if you know where to look. So it's, it's the way we used to do business back in the 90s versus the way we do business in the music, the music business today. I think it can be summed up by this. Um, in 1997 or 98, there was a... REM listening session. They had just released their Up album and they had this international listening session where they invited journalists from all over the world to do nothing more than go to Rio de Janeiro and listen to a record. That's how much money was flowing in the music industry these days. Now you don't see anything like that. There is so little money going along, uh, available. And basically what we have in the music industry is presidents and vice presidents and interns. There's very little in between because there just isn't enough money to support the kind of infrastructure that the music industry used to have. What are the pros and cons of this new landscape, though? Uh, I don't know if there are any. It, they, it just is. I mean, it, just is um, what it, is. It, it, it is because uh, you cannot fight technological disruption. Mm -hmm. And the record labels had a very hard time changing their business model because things had been working very, very well for them for about 100 years. Mm -hmm. To suddenly get out of the idea of the retail event of having a piece of plastic that you sold to the masses on a given day for a given price uh, to where we are now, where music flows basically like water, mm -hmm. uh, the huge transition. And a lot of people did not make it because it was it was such a, an expensive transition to make. How have the advance in technology uh, impacted the way we experience music? Oh, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one. This is somebody who has old baggage because I used to line up at midnight to get records on Tuesday morning. Okay, I was one of those guys. Um, the revelation came to me one Sunday morning when I was sitting at Starbucks with my dogs, and I was reading through my email. And I came across a song, I can't remember what it was, but somebody was raving about it in this email. Now, in the old days, I would have to write down the name of this artist, write down the name of the, the, uh, the album, uh, remember to take that note with me when I went to the record store, hope they had it in stock, uh, and then hand over 10, 15, 20 bucks, whatever it was, for that particular record, go home and then evaluate the song, whether I liked it or not. Instead, what I was able to do was call up a streaming music service and listen to the song within 30 seconds. And that completely, at that, that was my epiphany moment. That was the moment that I realized that things have changed completely. I no longer need to possess music. I'm okay with accessing it. 
Now, there are some things that I will want to possess, like box sets and certain vinyl records and certain CDs and the physical thing, or even the digital stuff when I do all my radio shows. I can't rely on the stream. I need some kind of physical manifestation of that music, be it uh, you know vinyl or plastic or zeros and ones. But for everything else, the stuff that I don't need to own, I just access. And that's what everybody is doing these days. I was looking at music figures for Canada today, and year on year, streaming is up 94% in terms of raw numbers. But if you look at the sales of digital albums, they're down a year from a year ago by 25%. You're telling me. <laughs> yeah. It's a, sales are way down. And this is the other thing. Now, as an artist, you have to think about you know, the apples and oranges of a sale versus a stream. They're not the same thing. They were never designed to be interchangeable. But a lot of people can't get over the fact that they're not selling as much music and they're making much less music from streaming, but you can't compare those two numbers because the payouts and the economics behind both of them are completely different. But how has it impacted how you approach your work? So far it hasn't impacted me all that much because I am still able to acquire and possess the music I need to create my radio shows. I can't use a stream for my radio show. I need CDs, vinyl, digital downloads. So it hasn't really impacted me at all. Uh, in the creation of, of that. In terms of working as a radio guy, we have to be very cognizant that uh, people are no longer willing to sit around waiting for their favorite song to come on the radio anymore because they don't have to. Mm-hmm. So radio is changing to become more of a, uh, a storytelling medium, back to the way it, it used to be 50, 75 years ago. Um, I think we're slowly seeing radio stations adopt different attitudes towards the number of songs that they play as part of their playlist, the number of times they play a song over the course of a given week, and a more greater emphasis on um, personalities like it used to be in the old days because there's no way that radio could win by being a Spotify playlist with with commercials. So there, there, are, there are some changes there. So radio is getting into things like podcasts. We're getting into things like, you know, different ways to, uh, you know, a different forms of on-demand audio. We're, we're creating um, a variety of, of partnerships with other media. So th- there is a big change that's happening with radio. Now, I should point out the radio is still very strong, very profitable, very powerful. 93% of uh, any given population tends to listen to radio on a weekly basis. But at the same time, it is an old technology that is one way and analog. It needs to evolve in such a way that it's going to appeal to people under the age of 25. That internet generation has never been not connected to the hive. So uh, it, it's, it's difficult because technology is changing so quickly. And we don't want to jump into anything because, well, we have in the past jumped into stuff only to find out that six months later, oh, that old thing, we're, we've moved beyond that. So we have to make sure that, that we're not chasing our tails, chasing ghosts, chasing vaporware, uh, and that we will get some kind of long-term return on our investment because otherwise, you know, our owners are not going to be happy. Yeah. And this actually leads pretty much into the next point that I want to talk about, which is podcasting. But I kind of want just to touch on um, the, what you were saying about radio and how a lot of radio stations are changing the approach and that it's not just, you know, that they are not going to be playing the same songs over and over and over. Because I think that's the problem that a lot of people have with radio, certainly here, is that you turn it on, you hear the same six songs all day. Yeah, it's, that's the way radio used to work. And the, the it was very, very successful because you never knew exactly who was listening to your radio station at any given time. So mm-hmm. you played the, the popular songs more often in hopes that the majority of the people who were tuning in at any given time heard a song that they wanted to hear. That is no longer, that paradigm no longer works because everybody's got a smartphone and they can hear whatever song they want to hear, whatever they want to hear, wherever they happen to be and whatever device they happen to have. So radio has to figure out how to get away from doing the same old things that they've been doing for, well, since the early 1950s. Yeah, sure. And you think now that, um, you know, with podcasting becoming more prominent, I mean, I I don't think it's going to you know, stop radio. I don't think it's really going to, you know, make radio no longer be a thing. But do you, what do you think it means for the future of traditional broadcasting? And and how do you think the broadcasting industry will adapt? Okay, look at this, look at it this way. Uh, Radio is a multi-billion dollar industry that creates audio. Uh, Right now, the audio is created for live, real-time broadcasting over AM, FM, and DAB transmitters. 
why can't you take that expertise and that infrastructure that you have and turn it into more on-demand programming? Uh, there are a few problems with that. A lot of that has to do with licensing and regulatory issues and copyright when it comes to things like music. But these are not insurmountable. Radio is a great, great creator of audio entertainment and audio information. So it's just a matter of another case of, of repurposing. For example, um, my ongoing history program, we finally decided that we were just going to podcast this thing, but we would have to take out pretty much 99% of the music. Mm -hmm. So we did. And uh, we've had it up on iTunes for a while. And uh, this morning, as a matter of fact, uh, we passed the 100,000 download mark. So oh, that's it's working. All. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's working. And we... <laughs> We just have to figure out exactly how to, to monetize that. And it's it's difficult because um, I don't own the rights to it. I uh, work for a higher person, so I work for a company called Chorus Entertainment, and they own the show, and it's up to them to monetize it. So, But how do you do it in the, in, in the, uh, in the uh, podcast world when metrics are so crappy? I mean, all, mm -hmm. we, ha all we have for, for podcasts right now is number of downloads, which tells us almost nothing about how the podcast is being consumed. How many people actually listen? How many people listen to five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes? Who are these people? Uh, what is their age and sex and uh, economic makeup? Uh, you know, all these things, all these metrics are not available to podcasters yet. That, however, is changing as people are trying to figure out exactly how to measure things better. And once we get uh, that nailed down, the whole market's going to explode. Alan, are you ready for 20 questions? Yes, go. Coffee or tea? A uh, coffee. Meat or veggies? Oh, meat, please. I'm Canadian. <laughs> I'm Canadian. I'm vegan. Don't hate me. <laughs> ah, there we go. Okay, let me put it another way. Meat, uh, because I'm from the Canadian prairies. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Twitter or Facebook? Uh, Twitter, probably, because I don't have time for all the shenanigans on Facebook. <laughs> That's right. Shenanigans, yeah. I like that. <laughs> Indie or major? Depends on the band, although I do tend to skew indie. Oh, yeah. CD or vinyl? Vinyl. Oh, absolutely vinyl. I knew you'd be I a just vinyl bought, guy. I just, <laughs> just got it. In fact, on the other side of this wall, that wall over there is yeah. a brand new stereo that I haven't mm -hmm. fired up yet, but it's all about vinyl. Now, I'm, I'm outnumbered here, but Canada or Scotland? Never been to Scotland, although I have a very nice Scottish brother-in-law. He's been enticing me to go see Edinburgh. Ah, you should. Isn't that where you're from? Mm. No, no, you're Marcio, not I can't believe you've we've known each other. How long, <laughs> Marcio? Sorry, how long? No, 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 no Marcio. I'm from Inverness. I live in Glasgow. Inverness, but, that's it. It sounds but, so weird to me. But I do have family in Edinburgh. In Edinburgh, Edinburgh. there nice. we go. Forgive me. Education or experience? <sighs> I would have said education forty years ago, but now I say experience. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you're a music geek. I don't know if you're a comic geek, but Marvel or DC? I'm tired of the Marvel universe, so I'm going to go with DC for the time being. <laughs> Manitoba or Ontario? Wow. Okay, I live in Ontario. I'm from Manitoba. Let's put it this way. Manitoba in the summer in July and August. Mm, I've never been. I need to travel it up there. And you need experience. There you go. Yeah. And then Ontario, you don't want to be in Manitoba between November and March. <laughs> so I should stop complaining about our winters in Ontario. <laughs> you will please do. You have no idea. It's all, it's all comparative, isn't it? <laughs> Talent or attitude? Attitude. Because... Uh, Talent is something that can be done... Talent is something that, that's innate, and sometimes talent is very, very hard to harness. Uh, it's very important, but attitude can help you get a little bit further than sheer talent, I think. I hope no one hates me for this one, because I'm a huge, I, I, a huge fan of Nirvana, and I grew up in listening to Nirvana very young, and definitely was a huge inspiration on me, but that, I'm going to be very careful how I say this, but that was a lot of attitude. A lot of attitude. Yes, it was. And that's why yeah, it works. See, see, attitude can be mistaken for for talent. Yeah, uh, because if you um, if you know what you're doing, you can. I don't want to say you can fake it, but at the same time, 
if attitude, see, attitude in itself can be, be a talent, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and, and you can, if, if you can think your way through something or act your way through something, who can tell? And let me just, let me just clarify. I think that Kurt Cobain was a great songwriter, really great songwriter. Was he the best singer or player? No, but fantastic songwriter and they changed music. So just, okay, just want to be careful that. <laughs> okay. No, well, let's look at it this way. Uh, would, would you do um, uh, a contestant from The Voice or Tom Waits? Okay. Now the, yeah. the, the talent for the contestant of The Voice when it comes to singing, far better than, than right. Tom Waits singing. But right. the attitude of Tom Waits makes him much more interesting. Absolutely. That's a perfect analogy. Now, this one I'm interested in. It's not musical, but it's fun. The Simpsons or Family Guy? Wow. I know, right? Um, <laughs> Simpsons for six seasons. After that, forget it, Family Guy. So again, not music related, but... Uh, I know that you watch both these shows, or at least your Facebook tells me you do. <laughs> Modern Family or 30 Rock? I like 30 Rock simply because of the, well, I, I like Tina Fey. Um, yeah, but I would have to go with Modern Family simply because I know a couple who are a spitting image for um, uh, Claire and her husband. <laughs> Star Wars or Star Trek? Meet them. Star Trek, oh, please, don't even, <laughs> stop. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, this question makes me glad that you said DC earlier because it means you might have an opinion on this one. So, Batman or Superman? I think Batman, he needs an antidepressant. <laughs> so, you know. But we found that we have, we've noticed on this show, and I, I think we're at like 130 plus interviews we've done now, and most artists pick Batman. So does it make sense? I think it kind of makes sense. I don't sense. know. <laughs> you know, Batman, this this tortured character. That's what I mean. <laughs> um, yeah, I would. I was my first comics when I was growing up was was Superman, and I found Batman too dark. See, I, I Batman I always related to. Batman was my jam. <laughs> it makes sense though. <laughs> Rush or Kiss? Oh, Rush! I'm Canadian. There you go. Absolutely, I, I got into playing drums because of Neil Peart. Oh, no kidding. Oh, That's yeah. actually why I put that question in here because I, I read that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Jackson or or Michael Bolton. You notice that I'm pausing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm and that, that you're uh, intrigues and excites me. <laughs> I okay, Michael Jackson, uh, wonderful weirdo talent. Michael Bolton lately has discovered that he is the source of a lot of jokes, uh -huh. the point of a lot of jokes, and he's going with it. it you got to respect so he, that. You got to respect the, 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 the self-awareness and the self-parody that Michael Bolton is now engaging with. Yeah. And whenever he's on with, uh, for example, uh, last week tonight with John Oliver, I kind of like him. Because he does have that sense of humor about himself and his image. I love that. It shows, I don't know, it, it, the self-awareness, like you said, there's no ego there. Or at least, no. you know, because most, most people would not be able to do that. <laughs> Celine Dion or Marilyn Manson? Manson. I've always been a Manson fan. Me too. Love him. Whale or kale? I hate kale. <laughs> I just absolutely... Well, it's a weed. Alan, we won't there go is for no... lunch. You and I can go for coffee, but we'll just keep... We, we won't do the lunch <laughs> thing. <laughs> we will not do it. Kale is a weed that is bitter and awful. Nobody... Needs, I, I just, mean, I won't eat... I just made some I, great kale chips this weekend, though. I bet you'd I, love no, them. No, there's They're no really... such thing as great kale anything. <laughs> I mean, with whales, with whales, I'm not going to eat a whale, yeah. but I think whales are very pretty, so I would rather spend time in the company of a whale than in a... <laughs> Field of kill. Yes. <laughs> Bet Midler or the Riddler? Just because they rhyme, Rylan. Uh, no, which Riddler? Oh, Jim Frank Carrey. Gorshin. Your pick. No, Frank, your pick. No, okay, you know your pick. Frank, your pick. Your pick. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Frank Gorshin Riddler. Okay. There you go. I would take him. And I'm a little and bit nervous about this one. <laughs> most important question: Ross or Marcio? I know. Ooh, right? You have a cool accent. <sighs> Oh, Ellen, you're breaking my I'm heart. I know, I'm sorry, but you <laughs> like kale. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, you, but you I, do in my world, that's that a good Marcia. thing. <laughs> it's a deal breaker in mine. <laughs> and now I've got to follow up with the next question, of course. 
Yep. I'll wipe away the tears. I'll wipe away the tears. Alan, for anyone who wants to get into broadcasting or writing about music, where would you recommend uh, people get started? One of the best things you can do is go to school for it because at least you'll have the proper practical skills that if you get that first job or even an internship, you'll actually be able to be of use to some people. It's still best to go through, in my opinion, um, the the standard... um, Legacy media like radio, television, uh, print even. There is uh, record labels still hire interns quite a bit uh, to help them out through, through you know, some of the, um, the, the, the tougher stuff through the, through the year. Get inside the, the, the current media establishment and see where that takes you. It's very hard to do things outside and on your own because you're dealing with some very, very tough competition. But if you can get somebody on the inside to take you under their wing, that's the best thing you can do. What sort of advice would you have for people like like Ross and I, who have kind of gone the podcast route? You know, we don't have any formal education in this. We really don't know what the hell we're doing. We're just having fun. Well, but well, we love what with we podcasting, do. You know? with, with, with podcasting, it's a wild west right now. We don't know where it's going. I would continue down the road that you're, you're, you're going. Um, and then if you find some opportunities or if somebody approaches you with a, an opportunity to maybe join a network, you know, at least entertain the suggestion. Um, and remember that you have to, there, there's so many people that are doing podcasts right now. There's gotta be something that sets you, that sets you apart from everybody else. Uh, and then find a way to rise above the noise, the signal to noise ratio in all entertainment right now is unbelievable. Maybe, you know, Ross, uh, do a sex tape. Try that. Yeah. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah, well, for the Kardashians. You know, that yeah. didn't quite work out last time. But, uh, <laughs> That's how we met, know, actually. That's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I've got, I've got so much stuff on Marcio I could leak, but I promised him I wouldn't. I promised. <laughs> is there one piece of advice that you've been given or learned throughout your career that you would like to pass down to others? Say yes to everything. Uh, and the reason is that life is a very, very twisty road and you never know when an opportunity is going to run straight into some dumb luck. I mean, nine times out of 10 or maybe 19 times out of 20, an opportunity will lead nowhere. But then there's that one time where things change. I did something uh, a number of years ago with William Shatner, of all people. Oh, wow. And he told me that uh, he says yes to everything in the hopes that uh, by throwing all sorts of stuff against the wall, one of these things is going to work. And the man's 86 years old. He keeps on going. And I have all the respect in the world for him. So uh, say yes to everything. Unless, of course, it means bodily harm or financial ruin. And that, that comes from Captain Kirk uh, directly. <laughs> comes from Will. So you know it's good advice. It's from our bro, yes. Will. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, where's the best place for people to uh, connect with you online and actually... Chat with you. Uh, probably my, my website, which is a journal of musical things.com. It's updated every single day, including Christmas. Wow. And uh, that is sort of a portal to everything that I'm doing, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever. Mm-hmm. And if you want to get the ongoing history of new music podcast, it's available now through iTunes. It's free. Just go there, subscribe, and see what happens. That's awesome. Awesome. And as for our show, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, iTunes, and YouTube. Don't forget to visit our website and pick up one of our shirts while you're there. Or two or three. And as I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the show, my brand new Acoustic EP, The Reimagining Volume 1, is now available everywhere. I'm also working on my second full-length solo album, and you can be a part of it at marcianovelli.com slash pledge. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, and Patreon, which are all my name, Marcio Novelli. It's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. And I'm working on websites for various artists at the moment, and you can check out my work at electrickiwi.co.uk. You'll find me on Twitter and Instagram as Electric Kiwi and Facebook Electric Kiwi Design. This episode was brought to you by 30 Roses, a virtual assistant and consultant to musicians and other creatives, as well as Chris Keaton, music entrepreneur HQ, Buck Naked Soap Company, and Social Surge. All links are in the show notes, so please check them out because what do they do, Ross? They help to keep the show alive. <laughs> um, <laughs> and if you'd like to sponsor the show, visit patreon.com slash bridge the Atlantic. Uh, as we mentioned at the start of the show, we've updated our rewards recently, which uh, now includes sponsorship at the start of our interviews, as well as an opportunity for you to co-host an episode. And uh, we're excited to see how that one pans out. Um, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and iTunes so you don't miss any episodes and leave us a comment and let us know what you think of the show. Alan, thank you for everything you do. Uh, thank you for sharing the the history of music that uh, the untold history 
on music. Oh no, I'm I'm calling it untold. I'm calling oh, it untold okay. until Alan has told it. I'm changing because Alan doesn't like the name. I'm changing it all. I'm, I'm doing that. Uh, but uh, no, Alan. Too late. Thanks for coming on, man. We really appreciate it. And uh, please do come back again sometime soon. I'll say yes. <laughs>